Hi there. I'm going to go ahead and uh, do some more commentary and stuff on uh, Simulation Canada's Scourge of God, Campaigns of the Mongolians. This time I want to go over the sequence of play a little bit, and then I want to discuss some of the game's systems, and probably just go through a few examples um, of play and then hopefully in the next video or two I'm going to try and start actually playing the game a little bit. It'll be a first time look at the game uh, in action I guess for me. So I'm gonna go ahead and get started here with the sequence of play. Okay let's just briefly go over the sequence of play. Um, if this is in focus, if you can read it, General, each round of the game is composed of 11 turns, and each of these turns is composed of a Mongol player phase followed by an Empire's player phase. In addition, each of these phases is composed of a rigid sequence of segments whose order may not be varied. The player whose phase is in progress is... Yeah, let's see. Boy, that's hard to read for me. Is a uh, term the phasing player. Sorry about that. And like I said... In the the game is actually played in um, well, like it says, in two rounds of which one player will play the empires, the other player will play the Mongols, and then we'll switch for the second round, and then both players will tally up their victory points after having played both sides, and then they'll determine their uh, whether they uh, have won the game or not. Anyway, moving on. We have the Mongol player phase, which is composed of the Khan death segment. Number two, the garrison dispersal segment. Number three is the recruitment segment. Number four is the movement segment. <clears throat> Number five is combat segment. Number six is the return movement segment. Number seven is the garrison creation segment. <clears throat> and then B, the empire's player phase is much shorter composed of one, the recruitment segment, two, the movement segment, three, the combat segment, and four, the dispersal segment. And I will go into these different uh, segments and systems uh, when I come back. Okay, the first thing we have is the uh, con death segment. Basically, in this segment, the Mongol player will roll a single die to determine the fate of the Khan for this turn. If the result is a 1 through 5, the Khan survives the period and the turn is conducted normally. However, if the result is a 6, the Khan has died. During a turn in which the Khan has died, the Mongol player may act normally in all manners except the creation of garrisons. No Mongol garrisons may be created during a turn in which the Khan has died. I'm going to try and stick with the sequence of play, so some of these um, segments and stuff may seem to be a little bit uh, out of order. You may not understand them until they are placed in order, but it's just better, I think, to follow the sequence of play and go from there. Okay, after the con death segment, we have the garrison dispersal segment. <clears throat> In this segment, the Mongol player can voluntarily remove any of his Mongol garrison units that are on the map and place them with Mongol units that are subject to recruitment during the current and subsequent phases. Garrison dispersal and combat losses are the only ways in which a unit that has become a garrison is returned to being a normal unit again subject to recruitment. Basically once a unit is turned into a garrison it has to stay that way until <clears throat> this phase where you can voluntarily remove the garrison and place it back basically in the recruitment pool. Pro, ugh, recruitment pool. <clears throat> Sorry if my voice sounds all stopped up and all that. I suffer from seasonal allergies which seem to last all year long. So anyway, um, and then they can be recruited again during this same turn or any following turns. Next comes, next comes the uh, Mongol recruitment segment. In this uh, segment, the Mongol player will recruit units that are in his uh, force pool, basically. 
um, that have been uh, previously removed due to attrition, combat, garrison dispersal, some other sort of dispersal, as well as units that have never been on the map yet. They're all available for recruitment. Uh, let's see. There are recruitment centers. I'll try to show you one here without making uh, making you too sick for my camera <clears throat> camera photography. Let's see here. We're going to move this out of the way. This here is a very poor example of a recruitment center. This recruitment center belongs to the Empire's player uh, who controls the uh, in uh, Indian uh, nationality units, whatever. Um, it has a value of one, which basically means that when the Empire player gets to uh, recruit, uh, gets to recruit, then he can recruit basically just one unit there, and it's basically a recruitment limit. I know I'm not on their, I'm not on the Empire's recruitment uh, segment yet, but anyway, I don't want to stretch the cable clear across the map and mess things up. So this is just a good brief example of what a recruitment center looks like. The only difference with the Mongol ones is it says Mongol. So anyway, <laughs> um, The recruitment centers contain the name and the nationality of units to be recruited in that center, and the number indicates the maximum number of units to, uh, of that nationality that may be recruited. <laughs> and this is where it's discussing units and not unit strengths. In other words, if that recruitment center that I just showed you of, in, of the Delhi player or nationality, <laughs> one unit can be created there, only one counter. However, that counter provided. Uh, the force pool for those that particular nationality contains such a unit as a four or more strength unit. <clears throat> you know, I could put a four strength unit there, but it's just the one unit. You know, I could put a one strength unit there. I could put a two strength. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what the recruitment center's number is, other than that is just a number of counters that can be put there. Or units, and it can be of any strength. I guess that was a long-winded explanation of what they just said. <clears throat> well, let's see. We have the concept of active or inactive recruitment centers. All the Mongol recruitment centers start the game active and are active for the rest of the round, or the rest of that game, I guess. Uh, none of the Empire's recruitment centers start the game active. Um, they are only activated when uh, <clears throat> whenever a Mongol unit moves adjacent to the hex containing an Empire's recruitment center, then that center and all other centers of the same nationality, that is, with the same name, become active immediately and remain so for the rest of the round. To indicate, indicate that such a center or group of centers has become active, flip all Empire units of that nationality on each such center front side up. Um, that's the only time basically that the Empire players units <clears throat> and yes I know I'm dwelling on the Empire player but I'm just going through the recruitment in general right now uh, that's the only time that his units will ever basically be face up so we'll try to pull back here to Delhi again so if there was a Mongol unit here then all the units that are Delhi become face up. But if I just learn it I can just flip them or hold on to them. Delhi. So all those units would now become um, active recruitment players for the Delhi nationality. The remaining uh, nationalities uh, will remain face down. Um, it's not really so much a game of hidden movement and such, or hidden strengths. They're more of a mnemonic device, I guess, to let you know which empire's <clears throat> pieces or which empire nationality, I guess, 
are active and you know can recruit and all that stuff I don't think it has anything to do with the actual Empire's movement or anything like that it's just basically to show you that that part of the Empire's uh, units are uh, active and that type of thing. I'm going to move this camera up just a little bit. Try to get my light things up a little bit. Uh, maybe not. Anyway, <clears throat> we'll see if that helps. All right, back to the Mongol player phases. Um, once he's done recruiting and all that type of stuff, you just put a unit on there, like I said, with any uh, strength that you want. All right, <clears throat> now. Um, there is some errata on the Empire's recruitment. It says something about their center, recruitment center that contains one or more Mongol units that are not garrisons <clears throat> may still recruit, but do so at half its normal recruitment value, rounded up. Somewhere in there, there is some errata, and I'll have to find it <clears throat> when I go to play. Um, but the other thing is, I guess I wanted to point out, um, that the Mongol player and the Mongol player only can capture a recruitment center and recruit units from that Empire's recruitment center, which he just captured. <clears throat> um, let me see, what else was I going to say? That well, slipped my mind for the moment. Perhaps I'll uh, think about it here in a second. Um, I guess what I was thinking of is, well, I just basically said that. Um, well, I don't know what it was. Perhaps I'll come back to it. The next thing we have is the Mongol movement segment. This is a little uh, more, it's kind of standard, but it also introduced uh, a few other concepts. Um, I don't know if they were really, you know, revolutionary at that time or just copied from other designs of that period but anyway it's pretty neat to see in an older game <clears throat> basically during the phasing player's movement phase he may move any or all of his units on the map that are front side up so I guess this has something to do with the uh, with the recruitment thing and let me see during that yes yes okay sorry um, Units on recruitment centers that have not been activated and garrisons will be front side down and hence may not be moved. <clears throat> uh, when we get to garrison creation, I guess I'll talk more about how garrisons act and work. <clears throat> but um, anyway, so units that are upside down cannot be moved until they become activated, basically. And then, <clears throat> as a unit is moved it accumulates what are called attrition points and when a player stops moving the unit the unit must roll for possible attrition <clears throat> there's an attrition table Let's see if I can show it to you without mangling the counters that I have here I'm not gonna be able to show it to you in much detail I'm afraid but it's over here the right edge of the map and you're probably not gonna be able to read it anyway but trust me there are attrition tables loaded right, uh, located right there, and we will discuss them here in a minute. Basically, it works on the the farther you move a unit, which has an unlimited movement uh, factor or range. you will accumulate uh, attrition points. Each unit is moved individually and must complete its movement before starting the movement of the next unit. So units move individually. There are no movement of stacks, so to speak. The movement of the unit is traced through a path of adjacent hexes until it arrives at the point to which the facing player wishes it to move. There's no limit to the number of hexes a unit may enter during its movement, but for each hex entered, and for some hex sides crossed, the unit accumulates attrition points. To determine the attrition points accumulated for each hex or hex side type, cross the religion, 
group of the unit with the type of terrain on the attrition susceptibility table. In addition, a moving unit acquires attrition points equal to two times the, the number of, of opposing units in a hex. <clears throat> Let me read that again. Like I said, this font type is a little hard to read, especially for older eyes. Um, in addition, a moving unit acquires attrition points equal to two times the number of opposing units in a hex that it enters and leaves during the movement segment if it is an empire's unit and one times the number of opposing units if it is a mongol unit. So in other words, empire player has to pay much higher attrition point cost if he moves into a hex containing mongol units. Alright, so basically after you determine the attrition point total for the unit you find the column indicated on the by the range in which the total falls on the attrition resolution table and you roll a die. Cross uh, referencing the cross referencing the die and the range. Uh, let me see. Line with the uh, column. If the retrie, uh, if the result is a dash, there's no effect. If the result is an A, the unit has a treated and is removed from the map and placed with units that may be recruited in later turns. It is not counted for victory points, and you repeat this procedure for each unit that moves. So, if you move too far, you're going to uh, risk a great. The farther you move, the greater the risk of losing a unit. And since they move individually, um, it's theoretical that you can use it to lose every unit that you move because every column has been a chance of uh, attrition. And some of the, uh, the religions um, pay more based upon the type of terrain they're moving through. And another thing to note is the color of the pieces represent different religious groupings, I guess is the best way to put it, <clears throat> for, uh, let's see, you've got these tan ones over here, which are, is China or Chinese, or what will become China, whatever. And then you got the ones there kind of tan. They're going to be your Arabic Middle Eastern pieces. The ones up here are going to be uh, your, I don't know, Christian, Western, uh, Western religions. And then off to the side, way over yonder here, we have the Japanese, uh, Japanese culture. I wonder if they just should have called them cultures and not religions. I have no problem with that, but I think perhaps uh, the terminology might make a little bit of a difference. Anyway, those crazy Canadians. Okay, what comes next is the combat segment. This is fairly straightforward. Combat takes place during uh, each combat segment between units of the opposing players that occupy the same hex. Each such hex resolves uh, combat in an individual set of rounds, and combat in such hexes is mandatory. Phasing players the attacker, non-phasing non players the defender. You have three combat results tables. I show them to you, but you probably couldn't see them anyway because of my lighting <coughs> and the plexiglass glare. Uh, when, resol when resolving combat for a hex, the first action is for the defending player to pick which table will be used <clears throat> in all rounds of combat for that hex. Note that if the defender is the Empire's player, he may only choose the stand or retreat table. <clears throat> Excuse me. If the defender is the Mongol is a Mongol player, he may only choose the ambush or retreat table. After you determine the table that the units in the hex are turned over to reveal their combat strengths, except garrison units, which are already uh, strength side up. This is the only time that the players are allowed to examine the strengths of opposing units. Well, you know, opposing active units. If the units are not active yet, then you're going to know what the strength of the unit is. Uh, anyway, yeah. moving on. 
Both players will total their strengths in the hex and express these totals as a ratio of attacker-defender, finding the right column of that ratio on the CRT, rolling a die, and then you find out what the result is. <clears throat> Each side then removes any strength losses, <clears throat> excuse me, indicated by taking off units of at least the required strength. If other unused units of that nationality are available, they may be used to make change to get as close to the as close as possible to the actual indicated strength to be removed, but if not possible, but if not possible, any excess any excess strength with uh, the removed units is lost as well. Um, let's see, all strength removed. I just read that. All strength removed, including any excess above the indicated, but still removed due to a lack of proper change, are counted as combat losses for victory purposes. Then, after you remove the losses, the attacking player then decides if he wishes to play a further combat round in that hex. And if he does, the procedure is repeated for the remaining forces. Uh, the attacking player may resolve up to three rounds of combat in each combat hex. After you resolve all desired combat rounds for the hex, any remaining units, uh, any remaining units, over so that their strength is again concealed. Turn any remaining units over so that their strength is concealed, except for garrisons, which always remain backside up. And repeat the procedure for each hex containing units on both sides. Then you have religions. Empire units of different religions may not combine in a com in a combat in a hex, and they should not even be in the same hex due to the movement restrictions. <clears throat> units of different nationalities, but the same religion may combine their combat strengths if in the same hex during a combat phase, and the order can be determined. Uh, uh, the order of combat can be determined by the resolution. Uh, order of resolution can be determined. By the phasing player. There, that was easy. And uh, let's see what else we have. Moving right along, we have the return movement segment, which only applies to the Mongol player. Uh, in this segment, the Mongol player must again move his units, but in this movement, all units that will not attempt to become garrisons must move to hexes containing Mongol recruitment centers, either of the printed. Uh, printed on the map or previously created garrisons. Just to avoid a little bit of confusion, um, the recruitment centers are located on the map as I've shown you. Uh, whenever a Mongol player creates a garrison, and they're the only player that can create a garrison, you flip the unit over in any hex that's on a step terrain type and says Mongol on it. And then it becomes a recruitment center, basically. Garrisons are recruitment centers. <clears throat> so maybe that'll clear some things up. Let's see. The Mongol player must move his units to a garrison or a Mongol recruitment center. <clears throat> and let's see. They have to be in step terrain. That are in step terrain hexes. Note that units that are attempting to become garrisons cannot serve as centers for this purpose until after they have become garrisons. Movement and attrition are carried out in a normal manner except that units that will be attempting to create a garrison, which comes after this I guess, eh, well in the next segment, I guess that's at the first part of the next turn, uh, in the next segment may not be moved in this uh, segment. Some other things about movement, I'll just jump back a little bit. This applies pretty much to everybody. Stacking, there's no stacking limits. There's no limit to the number of units that can move through a hex. Maneuver, moving unit. A uh, moving unit may never move adjacent to more than two separate hexes containing opposing units during a single movement segment. During the return movement, Mongol units may never move adjacent to any opposing occupied hexes. And then we have the religion of the empire units may not enter a hex containing the recruitment center of a nation of a different religion than the moving unit, nor may empire units of different religions and their move in their movement in the same hex. However, empire units may enter a hex containing a recruitment center of a nation of a different nationality but the same religion, and may move in the same hex as such into the same hex as such a unit. 
Bulgar units are not under any of those, any such restrictions. Mountains, nobody can cross a mountain. Then we have seas and walls. All sea hexides and the great wall hexides may be crossed at an additional cost in attrition points on top of the cost for the hex center. However, for sea hexes, this may only be done by moving from one coastal hex to another coastal hex. You may not enter a um, full sea hex. Now, in the case of an invasion of Japan, I'll try to move over here uh, with some detail. Uh, if it focuses and all that stuff, you can see partially that there are several hexes, particularly down in Indochina and uh, northern Japan, that you can cross uh, into Japan by not entering a full C hex. So, basically, to make that simple, they've just made it so that you can. Uh, go from one hex to the other without entering a whole all C. Anyway, that is pretty much that for both players. Uh, I know I skipped around a lot. Um, the only other thing is probably the garrison creation, which is a Mongol only thing. Only the Mongol player may create garrisons. This is done during the garrison creation segment. Um, Garrisons cannot move, but they retain all their other functions, such as attacking, defending, etc. <clears throat> so, moving in, moving adjacent to a Mongol garrison, it can attack you during the combat phase if you remain there. Anyway, <clears throat> you can create one by taking a unit that's in a hex that contains, should be a step hex, that contains the Mongol um, word Mongol. Oh, let's see, where am I at? Can you see any of this at all? I love uh, webcams. Anyway, right there in the glare and shadow of the webcam, you can see Mongol there in the step terrain. Basically, all this green terrain is step, except for the green terrain with the wood symbol. <clears throat> so, anyway. That is where you can create a Mongol garrison. You flip a unit over, doesn't matter what strength it is. Well, actually, it will matter what strength it is. Um, because that, the strength of the garrison will be like the recruitment center uh, strength, in that that will be the number of units that you may recruit there, regardless of the strength of the recruiting, of the recruited unit. Um, to create, well, let me think here. Yes, only the Mongol player. Okay. Thought I had to back up for a minute. Um, Mongol units that are not in the recruitment center during the segment, the uh, garrison creation. Uh, let's see. And that also do not meet the above requirements are immediately removed from the map and counted as combat losses. So let's kind of go over that again because I think I skipped around a little bit. <laughs> during the garrison creation, we have, during this segment, the Mongol player must try to create garrisons with any Mongol units not in a hex already containing a Mongol garrison with any Mongol units. Uh, um, okay, well, let's just say I... Uh, the older you get, the harder it is to read <clears throat> and talk and think. Okay. During this segment, the Mongol player must try to create garrisons with any Mongol units not in a hex already containing a Mongol recruitment center. However, garrisons may only be created in hexes of steppe type terrain that contain the Mongol designation, Mongol in capital letters, or in a hex of other terrain type that contains an Empire's player recruitment center. In either case, the hex in which the garrison is to be created must contain no Empire units. Mongol units that are not in a recruitment center during this segment, the garrison creation segment, and that also do not meet the above requirements are immediately removed from the map and counted as combat losses. So basically the Mongol player has got to or has to pull back to a legal um, Mongol recruitment segment or garrisoned hex uh, 
by the end of the turn or suffer um, uh, suffer loss. Uh, okay. Then the procedure is units attempting to become garrisons in Mongol designated hexes do so automatically. You just flip the uh, unit over and it becomes a garrison. And you only can have one garrison per hex basically. So if you have a stack of 10 units, only one of them is allowed to create a garrison. You can't use more than one unit to create uh, a super large garrison or something uh, in the same hex. <clears throat> You turn the unit's front side down in the hex so that the strength side of the unit is facing up. All garrisons uh, are strength side up. Each unit attempting to become a garrison in an empire's recruitment center hex has to roll a die. On a roll of 1 through 4, the unit becomes a garrison and is flipped over to have its strength side up, or basically the back side. On a 5 or 6, the unit is removed and placed with the dispersed Mongol units, but not counted as loss for victory points. Mongol units may not attempt to become garrisons in hexes that already contain a Mongol garrison or a Mongol recruitment center. And as I said before, um, garrisoned hexes are the same as recruitment centers for the Mongol player. Okay, we also have dispersal. During the dispersal segment, the Empire's player must examine the location of each of his units and must remove from the map any unit that is not located in a hex containing a recruitment center of the same nationality as the unit. These, uh, these removed units may be recruited again in subsequent turns and are not counted as losses for victory points. So I know none of this makes sense, um, but perhaps it will once I start showing some examples of play. Um, victor conditions are usually based upon combat losses, centers controlled, uh, what they call tranquil regions um, at the end of the turn or the last turn of, the, of a round. Any uh, Empire's player uh, nation or whatever that has not been activated by the Mongols uh, earns the Empire player's uh, victory point picture points. And let's see, mobile forces at the end of the 11th turn, the Mongol player receives victory points equal to the total strength of his on-map units that are not garrisons and off-map forces are not counted. So that's pretty much that. Um, I do have the game set up according to the setup instructions. Basically, the owning players place a number of units of their corresponding nationality equal to the recruitment value of each recruitment center in the location hex of the center. When placing these units, the Mongol player places his units so that the front side of his units are facing up. The Empire places his units so that the strength side is up. In addition, the players must place the lower combat strength pieces before placing the higher combat strength pieces. Um, all one units have to go down be placed down before you can place down a two, and all twos have to be placed before you can place a three. So even if a hex has a recruitment uh, value of a three, you have to put three ones there if you have any units available to place that are ones. Um, if you have a, a place that can only put four units down and you only have what, three ones and one two, then you can put down three ones and the one two and you have uh, four units there, regardless of the strengths, as long as you used all of your ones first before you place your twos and so on and so forth. Uh, let's see. Leftover pieces are placed aside and are available for recruitment. Within these limits, specific pieces of a nationality may be placed on recruitment centers of that nationality in any manner the controlling player desires. In addition, the Mongol player may examine the location of the placed Empire units before placing his own units. Once placement is completed, place the turn marker to indicate the first turn and begin the round. So, with that said, um, I will go ahead in my next video uh, show examples of play and probably do a short simple playthrough or a long boring detailed playthrough or I may just do a little of both so anyway if you have any questions don't ask me 
because I probably can't uh, answer them. But basically the game is just a, um, I'd say a light uh, game uh, depicting the uh, campaigns of the Mongolians in the uh, 13th century. Um, it doesn't have a lot of detail and since each turn is roughly five years um, you're not going to get a lot of detail um, because of the grand nature of the game you're not going to get sieges that last two or three turns and all that type of stuff and since the Mongol player knows pretty much the strengths and locations of all Empire players units uh, you know that accounts for the Mongols um, what I want to call it intelligence gathering and uh, all the things that they would do to take a city or whatever they didn't have much in the way of siegecraft until they uh, uh, got involved with the in China and stuff so once they uh, developed uh, sieging equipment they can take the cities a lot easier and so on and so forth so anyway you can read up on uh, the period and I'll shut up now and I'll come back later and like I say I'll try to give you more in-depth examples of play uh, hopefully in a more um, understandable format so until then see you later